This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunge and Tim Dahl. Simon Slater in the background. I was just reporting to my friends here how fascinating today's trial, if anybody saw it, and if you didn't take a recap on Fonnie Willis storming into the courtroom and they almost said she didn't have to testify. And if you don't know who she is, she's the one that's going to bring Trump down about the Georgia election bullshit which they're trying to trump her up on such petty charges. She stormed in. I mean, I'll vote for president. I'll take funny any day. And her lover, quote unquote, was so dignified, so calm, so reasonable, and also a bit of a chuckle fucker. So that's how I spent my day after getting back yesterday from my tour with Kevin Shane and Joseph Kegler. It was a very good time. How are you doing, Tim? Uh, you know, I did better. I had a pretty insane Valentine's Day, but that's pretty private. But I... Also had a Valentine's gig um, DJing, which I rarely DJ, but every now and then people ask me to do it, and I always have a good time doing that. Um, so at, I guess one of my favorite bars in New York, Mama Tried, which is near my studio. Um, well, hang on. And then today you had like a mega marathon. I didn't say mega. I said mega. With the new material you're working on for child support. Well, exactly. My band Child Abuse, we're, gonna, we're in the process of making – a spin-off band called Child Support. I've and, heard uh, some. I've heard a little tiddling of it, and I have so to say, it's very groovy rock. Yes, yeah, it's, it's basically going to be eh, us, so maybe a l- little simpler, but uh, but not. And we're going to have guest uh, vocalists on each track, so that's in the making. And uh, Eric Lau, the keyboardist, came in from out of town, and we're working on it. So just staying productive and creative which I absolutely like well speak about productive and creative although i don't know what direction this is going in but a team of scientists they're looking to dump chemicals into waters off the coast of massachusetts which is oh boy. one of your hometowns this summer to research whether doing so could be an effective way to counter ocean acidification and climate change so the project would see researchers from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, WHOI, pour approximately 6,000 gallons of sodium hydroxide, a component of lye, into waters 10 miles away from Martha's Vineyard in August of this coming year. Now, the research project, the project which is estimated to cost, oh, it's not that much really, 10 million, will receive taxpayer funds, funds from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. So the underlying concept of this, and we need new concepts for everything, is to see if the basic sodium hydroxide can reduce the acidity of ocean waters and make those waters more efficient repositories of carbon dioxide. So sodium hydroxide is common in rinse and soaps and cleaning solutions. Of course, it's harmful to humans in high concentrations. But I guess the amount they're dumping in Oh, so for instance, Tim, we both had to have a Tum or two on tour. Tums, right? Oh, sure, sure. So when you have heartburn, you eat a Tums. And that dissolves and makes the liquid in your stomach less acidic. And this is the analogy they're using to put in uh, this into the waters. Humans have been trying to control nature for a long time, right? And, and oh, we've ruined a lot of it. That's true. Problems. It's so weird because basically I was watching on this show, uh, Carbon Footprint, um, basically all the wild mammals, like once the Industrial Revolution hit, like by, by the time it hit the 20th century, all this shit was on the verge of being extinct. A lot of stuff still. So then like we're just holding on to the last five, 10 percent of everything to try to keep the ecosystem, you know, going. And, and of course, you know, horticulture, like basically all the trees east of the Mississippi now in the continental, continental United States, these are new trees. These are, these are like 150 years old or something like that because we immediately tore, or we cut them all down. So we had to re, uh, regrow them. It's always interesting. Sometimes we have success with this kind of stuff, but we, we try to- oh, Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, another, we, one we, that, another, another one that they're contemplating in geoengineering is, which is gonna be funded by the government and private sector or major donors, is a system that shoots particles 60,000 feet into the air to reflect sunlight and cool the atmosphere. Yeah, and I, another I, I, I project that. that aims to enlarge and brighten clouds, which, by the way, you know, I love the statistic clouds weigh about a million pounds to increase reflectivity. 
So uh, we got to we got to do something. He's also can uh, we can run into problems with this stuff. So going back to trees, the 60s and 70s, the whole Smokey the Bear campaign, which was a <laughs> part, cartoon bear that was basically trying to, you know, help people basically prevent for- forest fires was the whole thing. The problem was it was so successful that the uh, forests uh, were becoming so dense, n- not naturally. And there worst, are natural what worst forests. wildfires then? Well, well, there's wildfires that kind of have the whole system and that are actually important. Fires are important, actually. Regeneration burns. Yeah, yeah but, but then they got it. So the problem was once it got so dense, when there would be a fire, it got so out of control and ended up burning way more down than would have naturally right. burned down. So we kind of never really know. It's just trial and error, basically, you know, how we do that. Well, I got to tell you, this is my favorite error of the week because it's so idiotic. And again, where does it come from? Florida. Yeah. A Florida police officer has resigned after shooting up his own patrol car because he mistook the sound of a falling acorn for gunfire. I guess he hasn't watched enough forensic files. So according to the, to the Okaloosa Sheriff's Department, Jesse Hernandez was responding to a call from the girlfriend of Marquis Jackson, what a name, alleging that the suspect had committed, you know, had stolen her car and threatened her and was in possession of multiple firearms and a silencer. So Hernandez cuffed Jackson, placed him in his patrol car, but while approaching the rear of the car that was supposedly stolen, heard a falling acorn hit the car and thought he was being shot at. The officer no, no, no. heard yelling, shots fired on the body cam footage as oh, he no. does a body roll to avoid those pesky squirrels in the trees. I didn't write that. Drawing his weapon and loading it on his own patrol car. He also claimed that he'd been shot, telling his partner that he was hit while continuing to fire on the suspect. His partner, Beth Roberts, also began to fire at the car, believing that the gunfire was coming from inside the vehicle. Well, Hernandez, sorry about that, you dumb fuck, turned his badge <laughs> in and was found to have committed a policy violation regarding excessive use of control to resistance. <laughs> anyway, the female officer was cleared in the investigation because her use of force was objectively reasonable. I mean, maybe she knew that her partner was that much of a freaking idiot. Oh, my it's, God. It's, it's, it's funny It's, it's funny you bring this up. You've, it's funny you bring this up because obviously <laughs> bumbling cop stories are always funny and it's sad and tragic I mean, as well. Well, I, I think it, it hasn't been since Dukes of Hazard TV to TV shows. Now it's always propaganda of like these like romanticize romanticizing and justifying cop violence. Well, wait a minute. What about nine one one Reno? I didn't, oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't see that one. That's Goofy the only answer. All right. Well, what you, you say. Have, Goofy gobbledygook, Goofy, what do you say? Goofy cops is... Uh, okay, same thing. Yeah. All right, your stories are funny. I have dark ones. I don't know if you want to hear it. Well, no, it's, um, a, it's a turnaround. Why not? Give me some darkness, honey. I mean, I'm well, the light that right. goes around uh, without fail. I'm the Denali, radar of a dead star. <laughs> Denali, Dakota, Sky, Graham of Alaska just got sentenced to 99 years in prison um, for filming... Um, a friend of hers who was mentally handicapped, C.C. Hoffman, being murdered um, because some, I, I, it couldn't even have been true, some Indiana nutcase offered on the web $9 million for a film murder and they uh, uh, got some hick and they, and they ended up taping her all up and she started panicking and then, um, and then he shot her and threw her twitching body into a fucking river. So uh, that's a pretty good Did he collect story. the money? That money didn't Jeez. exist. Are you kidding me? It's, I mean, I mean, uh, you're doing uh, well, way. I mean, I have to say people kill people for less than nine million. Let's realize what just happened in Kansas City. By the way, I did play in Youngstown, Ohio, not to be confused with Youngstown, Pennsylvania, which I did at the West Side Bowling with which Joseph Keckler and Kevin Shea on Super Bowl Sunday, which has the high, highest rate of domestic violence. Therefore, I was just telling a couple of stories about sexual revenge. That, I mean, I, that is domestic violence day of the year for sure. Um, it is. Well, I mean, here's a little story about domestic violence or thrill against yourself. So man goes around Texas thrift stores shoving antiques up his piney. That's funny. As the story goes, why go through the trouble of buying a butt plug when you can simply shove antiques up your ass? 
For one kilt-wearing villain dubbed the Butt Pirate, this mm. question isn't a hypothetical but a way of life. The allegedly Putin perp terrorizing antique stores in Spring, Texas by shoving vintage goods up his booty. Damn, how much can he fit up there? All right, so they have security footage of the kilted horn dog. I didn't write this. I'm just quoting. Sharing a clip depicting the butt pirate grabbing what appears to be a spoon off a display table, taking it in his hands and popping it in while behind the birdcage. Now, anyone who's ever had a small child, they were potty training, knows that look, explained somebody who filmed him. Only he's not pushing something out. He's pushing something in. <laughs> Though the bottomless patron ultimately came, hopefully only to his senses, popping the spoon out of his orifice and placing it directly back where he found it, this was far from a one-time incident. Just in case there was any doubt he wasn't done, this is Tizian who filmed him. He saw something else that caught his eye. He picks it up, looks at it, and then does this little horsey stomp and proceeds to keister it, as they say, in the prison system. This is from e world, one of my favorites. So while the butt pirate opted to end his reign of rectal terror after the second incident, he picked up his pastime at other stores, a tidbit the antique store, store owner discovered after reaching out to other businesses in the oh. area. So, yeah, so one of the shop owners called her and said, guess who I have on camera? At his signature, Horsey Stomp, that's what they call him before oh shoving God. an item up his, you know, where. So anyway, question. <laughs> so uh, concerning the, you know, the pattern, the creator, like we've, everybody has questions about this guy's apparent king. What does he do in Walmart? One person says, what does he do in CVS? Is he just looking for random items that he can shove up there and then put back on the shelves for other people to touch and pur purchase? Well, you can all grapple with that, but the butt pirate is had been quickly apprehended. And that is as up to date as we have. We hope he had a tetanus shot and hope nobody else picked up the oh fucking spoon. Oh my God. I'm I'm glad that story exists. I'm glad that happened. <laughs> makes the hey, butt pirate, how about the horsey stomp? A lot of us like a little something up there every now and then, but we don't do it at a thrift shop because who knows where that's been. Please give me a break. Well so here comes another dark, <laughs> another dark story to counter balance. Her name's a little funny. Kennedy Little Dyke. Um, Which is such a great name. Yeah, I, I, it's a great name. This wasn't great. Um, she got into this insane car accident. No seatbelts. Launched. Thrown on top of, of a power cable. She's getting electrocuted. Hanging there. Her femur breaks. And basically, it, her, half her body is like hanging by skin. And, and she wait, 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 I rewind a little bit. Hang on. First of all, do we know where this happened? Idaho. She's hanging by skin, like part of her body. And it's like stretching. But she's upside down. So then it'll go river of blood. She's drowning by her blood, filling up her nose. I mean, people oh, think she's, she's still oh, alive. Can you just, just slow down on the details? Because. I'm loving this. It's so gruesome because <laughs> I'm a crane. I mean, it's just uh, people came to believe that she didn't just like bleed to death, but she was definitely unconscious and she woke up. Wow, this is even woke more up. She, she woke up. She woke up as her leg was being amputated in the emergency room. Wow. Um, so shocked. Shit. She, Kennedy Little Dyke lives, but uh, Kennedy that's Little Dyke death. lives. Uh, any idea why she happened to lose control of the car? <laughs> I, I think she was a passenger, actually. Um, but, wow. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess that brings up brings us to our next guest, who's sure. been the passenger in many a wild ride throughout both Toronto and New York and various other cities. She, uh, one of the original B girls, bass player, writer, vocalist. And now releasing poetry books and doing spoken word. I'm very happy to say that she took one of my spoken word workshops. She's been on the scene forever. And that's Cynthia Ross. And we're very happy to have her on. And she's going to read some stuff from her new coming poetry book. And uh, she's in the process of doing some performances. So we like to represent. And that's what we do here on the Lydian Spin with Liddy Lunch, Tim Dahl, and our guest, Cynthia Ross. <laughs> This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, 
and Cynthia Ross, the ultimate B-girl, composer, bass player, singer, performer, writer, here now with us. Hello, Cynthia. Hey, how are you doing? Good I'm doing you. just grand. Yeah, this is great. Well, last time I saw you was like a year ago in Toronto. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Which is what were you both doing in Toronto at the same time? You were there. I was at your oh. show. <laughs> Don't ask me to remember that. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the first time we even met, Cynthia, because when I was reviewing, especially New York Junk, one of your bands, which was such a absolutely New York state of mind sound. Really, yeah. it was such a continuation from the Heartbreakers, the New York Dolls, throwing a bit of bowling. It was really such a perfect New York sound. And I was looking at some photos and like, I must have been there at the same time, but I cannot remember when we first met. Do you? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we met probably in front of CBGB's. That's where I think we first met, like way before New York Junk. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't even know what year that might have been, but it was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. Were you there in 78? Oh, yeah, I was there in 76, 77, sure. So we moved in 76. So it was probably 77, I think. Who were some of the favorite acts you saw at CBGB's? And were you there like the rest of us almost every night? Because you had just come down from Toronto. Yeah, well, we actually, we used to drive down from Toronto at first with uh, the B-Girls. Then we started playing there so regularly that we just moved down, quit our jobs, slept on people's floors. Um, but yeah, we used to go there every night because the shows were good every night. And I think for me, like the kind of bands that we listened to were, of course, like the Heartbreakers and Mink DeVille. Mick DeVille, who gave me my name, Willie DeVille, gave me the name Lydia Lange. Oh, there you go. Those days, I guess it was like tough darts with Robert in the band. <laughs> All right, I have to ask you, because nobody seems to remember except for me, one of my favorite bands at the time, Manster. Oh, yeah. Okay, you're the only one. Yeah. T tall lead singer standing behind the drums, singing to Basement Tortures. Yeah. I loved that band. They were so weird, obnoxious. And uh, Chelsea Hotel story about them. But anyway, we also have a connection to the Stiv Bader experience. Oh, we do. Yeah. <laughs> which is really bizarre. I've told the story numerous times. I met the Stiv Baders on St. Mark's Place. He was in he was still living in Cleveland. I was living in Rochester. We were pen pals. <laughs> That's like, hilarious. I mean, he had an Iggy Pop T-shirt on. I'm like, who are you? Right. And we were pen pals for a few years. Before either of us, I mean, I got to New York before, but, and he was in Cleveland doing music and then that, then he came to New York and there we go. Right. So I met him walking down Young Street in Toronto, <laughs> uh, this brawny little skinny guy that looked interesting. And it was, uh, they were opening for the Ramones at the New Yorker Theater. And he just What year? Do you remember what year that was? Yeah, it was 76. And he said, uh, I'm here from New York. Do you want to go for dinner? And so I looked at him and I was like, what people don't realize about Stiv is he was such a gentleman. Totally. In spite of his stage, stage behavior. And he was really freaking sweet. He was, he was a super gentleman and yeah, he took me for dinner. I didn't know who he was, but I knew the Ramones. And, and then he said that he had to leave and go to soundcheck because he was playing the show. And did I need to be on the list? I said, no, I'm already on the list. And, uh, you know, that was the first meeting and we were pretty much inseparable since then. And you're right. He was like just a normal guy, not on stage. Just a sweetie, but, actually. Yeah. Just yeah. a freaking sweetie. Who would know? And it's interesting. We both met him walking down the street. The street. Here comes my guy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I mean, uh, he was never my boyfriend, but we had some good adventures together. That's for sure. And, uh, yeah, and I mean, let's face it, Dead Boy, Sonic Reducer, one of the best rock songs ever oh, written. Yeah. I mean, it is up there with Iggy. Okay, yeah, yeah, they're for sure. Not to mention they did write a song about me, but whatever. They did. <laughs> but also, I think that they were the only, for me, the only real punk band. Like, you know. At that period in New York, because, yeah. it, because it was no wave or more rock, more rock and roll, more post-New York Dolls, more right. Richard Hell. But I mean, look, 
there was so many different kinds of bands at that moment. And they often get, I mean, when you try to lump together Blondie, the Ramones, Richard Hell, Talking Heads, they have nothing freaking in common except no, for the time period they play. Yeah. And we all got called punk, which was such a misnomer, you know, but it, I guess it was like a bucket that they threw us all into. Well, you know what? I I was in my own bucket and it was no wave. And that right. was it. Although I might have been the most punk of all motherfucking punks just because I was punk, but not musically punk. Right. That's because <laughs> I, mean. I didn't want to learn those three chords. No. And we were we were like the Shangri-Las. So I can't you, except that we played our own instruments. So, mm -hmm. you know, rest in peace, Mary Weiss. But um, last week. But uh, yeah. I mean, we were like the Senders and Willie DeVille and more in that genre. Well, and you mentioned Tough Darts, who's uh, who's rarely ever mentioned either because style they had. Yeah, they had style. Style was semi important at, at that. I mean, look, Mick DeVille had a lot of style, let's face a it. Lot. Tough Darts had style. Yeah. And then there were the others. They were, you know, some slobs and people didn't care. I had style. I'm sure you had style. You did, you know, yeah. Some of us had, yeah. some of us you had both, style. You both still do. You both still we do. do. We do. I have to say we're looking pretty good. You can't see us, but we are. Oh, I mean, I'm in my PJs because I got too much work to do. But anyway, yeah, I feel good. I, I love I read something in Louder Than War, one of my favorite online, you know, reporters, reportages of music in general from an article they wrote about, I think it was about New York junk a couple of years ago. And they said about you, which I think we both have, I don't know how this kind of eternal youth serum, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's all the, whatever we swallowed. I'm not sure. Yeah. I think it's just, I how think much landed on your cheeks. Yeah. <laughs> ah, rub it in. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh God. But yeah, I mean, people ask me that all the time, as I'm sure they ask you, how is it possible? I don't know. It's like just the youth. Honestly, it's corny, but it's a youthful spirit. It's something I don't feel my chronological. But we're not jaded. Well, Surprisingly true. enough, we are not jaded. Joy, you, you, you appreciate life. Not everyone does, unfortunately. And we're all and we're always changing. So we're still maturing. That's how I look ah, at it. You know? okay. We want more experiences. We want different things. Uh, so let's talk for a minute. Let, let's go back to those, <laughs> those wild days. Let's go mention some more of the great shows that happened. At, and also, nobody can answer this question. Look, we were all underage. We never paid to get in. What the hell? I mean, I remember the first time I went to Max's Kansas City, or even CBG is totally underage. Nobody wanted ID. Nobody asked you to get paid. You were just, you're cute. You get in. Who, who, who do they charge in those days? I don't know. Maybe the kids, the bridge and tunnel kids. I guess you'd recognize them by their hair color. I'm not sure. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, we just used to walk up the stairs and walk in. Nobody said a word to us. No, they wanted us in there, I guess. So, and, and we wanted to be in there. We did. And well, and, and New York Junk had a song about going back to Max's. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, lots of stuff. I mean, that band was like something that I joined in 2008 after I'd been back in Toronto and not playing really for like quite a few years, raising kids and all that stuff, and came back and uh, started playing with that guy, Joe, again. And I'd been in a band with him in 1985, 84, with my husband, Billy Rogers, on drums, who then passed away from HIV. Oh, and, okay. um, you know, and we had two kids and that happened in Canada, you know, but. Um, Where it's better to raise kids than in America, no it doubt. Is. He was the one that wanted to move there. He was from Queens okay. and I didn't really want to move back there. You know, it was, but, he, was uh, being married to him. Is that, is that how you could live in New York? Is, is that you know, like no, no, we just lived. <laughs> Okay, just, okay. Nobody <laughs> cared at those at that point. Nobody cared. No, no. I mean, you had you had kind of a you know Canadian and American accents aren't that different. I couldn't work on the books or anything like that. But I did. I did. I cleaned people's apartments. I used to clean Nat Finkelstein's apartment. You know, the photographer, the mm -hmm. Andy Warhol uh, Velvet Underground photographer. And you know, I remember one time he owed me five hundred dollars because he didn't pay me for like three or four months. I mean, that was, I, I, I mean, come on, we can't afford that ever, especially not in those days. Right. What? So he paid me in photos, 
which I have, which are amazing. Signed time to number. sell, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Signed and numbered. I've sold everything else. I don't have anything left. I sold all the B-Girl stuff, all of Sid's, Stiv's stuff, uh, Johnny's stuff. I got rid of it all. I feel great. What did you have of, uh, you're talking about Johnny Thunders. Yeah, yeah. What did you have of his? Oh, I had clothes. I had jewelry. I mean, I kept a few things that mean. Were you his girlfriend for a while? No, no, no. Just friend? No, just a friend. I was supposed, I was the Madonna on the pedestal that was supposed to wait for him until he got clean. So. Never happened. Right. Yeah. Exactly. New York Dolls are why I ran away to New York in the first place. Let's face it. Boys dressed as girls looking hot. Come on. Yes, absolutely. Was selling all your stuff, I mean, maybe it was money motivated or you, do you, you just wanted to both. liberate? Uh, both. I needed money. You know, I, I, yeah. And I've had all this stuff in my closet down here in the city. And I felt like I was living in a grave. You know, like holding on to all these clothes and, you know, not just like Johnny's and my husband Billy's and then a lot of stiff stuff, his jewelry, his belt, you know, his T-shirts and Johnny's T-shirts and uh, photos. You know, and it's and it's great to have them for a while, but what, no, they got to go. And that was really good. I'm sure it was really a big relief, not only financially, but a big psychic relief. It was only last year. And it happened after um, I did an interview for that movie, Ghost of the Chelsea Hotel. And I hadn't been back there since the whole Sid and Nancy and me and Stiv days when we were living there. And I had avoided going in there. And when I went in there and I did the interview, Danny asked me, did you ever see ghosts when you were living here with Stiv? And I said, no. I didn't see any ghosts. I saw a bunch of crazy people that I knew running up and down the hallways, you know, like an insane asylum. Mm -hmm. But then I went and found the room on the main floor behind Stanley's desk where Stiv and I lived and Sid used to come down. How long day. did you how long did you live at the Chelsea Hotel? Six months. Six months. <laughs> we moved from place to place, as I'm sure you know the deal, you know. We I who did yeah, well, I did as well. Of course he yeah. moved around. Yeah. So how did you get into the Chelsea Hotel? Did you just go up and say, we need to live, we need some place to live? Yeah, Stanley, well, Stiv was a charmer. Stanley loved Stiv. He was like, the one thing he did, though, he wouldn't let us have the key to our room. So we had to get it because we were right beside the front desk. It was the main floor, the ground floor where the oh, lobby wow. was. So it was like this big, huge room that I don't really think was meant to be a room. It's now like some kind of private dining room. Now that it's been renovated. they've really reconfigured it. Yes, right, right. But he wouldn't let us have the key, and that way he could control who we had over. And so, yeah. the only person he let into our room was Sid and Nancy. Was Sid vicious? Yeah, uh, the finer people. <laughs> you know. But you're you're telling a story though. It was like a paranormal story. Oh yeah, you know? it was a paranormal. Exp I walked into this room when you went back recently. When I went back, just like three, four years ago. And I went into the room and before I walked in, I said to Man Lai who lives there and she, we had filmed in her apartment. I said, when we walk in, there's a bathroom on, on the left. It's got this crystal handle. It's got pain glass. And she said, oh my God, like, how do you know this? She said, because Richard Bernstein lived there after us, the guy that was the illustrator for uh, Interview Magazine. He died there. He died in that room. He committed suicide. And I walked into the room and I felt like I was in this weird vortex of voices and images. And I could see the couch where Sid used to be every day. And I started like feeling this pull. And it was like, you need to stay, Cynthia, you need to stay. Oh. And I just looked at Danny Garcia and I said, Danny, I need to I gotta go <laughs> out of this place. And I, I, and then I, I remember I said, you're dead and I'm not. And, you know, which is was, how you have to treat that kind of thing. Well, I was in the Chelsea hotel about two years ago doing an interview with Bibi Hansen. All right. 
I never lived at the Chelsea. I was only there really for one ex- ex- sexual experiment with Manster at one point. Okay. <laughs> and and but when I was there doing this interview with Bibby, <laughs> I went into the bathroom that the newly renovated Chelsea. Right. And I actually heard a ghost fart. There was <laughs> nobody in the bathroom and I heard. <laughs> I looked everywhere. Nothing. So bathrooms are haunted were you there i i I guess you weren't there at the same time that zoe hansen was there who eventually ended up sleeping on the bloody mattress no i think she was there later because she was there later yeah Yeah. i was yeah it was the 70s it was 1977 to 19 to no it was 1978 because we did that uh tv show that ephraim allen thing that's like uh spinal tap punk spinal tap with me and sid and stiv and Nancy and uh, we did that in November of 1978, two weeks before Nancy died. So, do, do you have any theories about that? I mean, you know, there's a few. Let's face it. Yeah. Well, Steve and I weren't there when it happened, which is why we were never interviewed by the police or anything. We were in Youngstown, actually, at his parents. Youngstown, yeah. Ohio. Ohio, yeah. I'll be in Youngstown, Pennsylvania in a few days. Go ahead. Okay. And uh, I I mean, knowing Sid, I, I cannot see him having done that. I mean, he was like a little boy. He was like a child, you know, an innocent, sweet. And, you know, he worshipped her. Yeah. So... You think it could have been just uh, you owe me drug money, bitch, and you're going down from somebody? Do you think that's that's Probably. what I what would be my theory? Yeah. And there was a lot of that. I mean, she was dancing in Times Square and she would leave him in our, in our room for the day. He idolized Stu. babysit, <laughs> babysit. And she would come back with like money, like pouring out of her purse, and, you know, right. Buy whole, some dope. Yeah. yeah. The whole thing. I, I mean, that I don't look, I, I didn't have anything to do with them at all. But my theory would be that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I don't believe either Sid, Sid Vicious no. was as vicious as his name. No, no, he was sweet. But leaving the place that day when I felt like I had this experience, I ran out onto the street and it was sunny out. And I looked at Danny. He goes, what the fuck happened to you in there? And I said, I felt like I was getting pulled to stay there. And I said, did you hear me say I'm alive and you're dead? And he said, no, I didn't hear you say that. I said, yeah, I said that. And I said, we got to go. So it was after that that I started thinking about getting rid of all the stuff back to the stuff. Right. Good, good idea. Yeah. And clearing out and making space. And also because I'm doing like a whole new thing, which relates to are like we've met on many different occasions, but that writing workshop that I took with you and I think it was- I, I did. OK, I did a writing workshop for mainly barmaids or people that went to bars a lot in New York at one point and you attended 2015. It was me and Zoe Hansen and uh, uh, I'm trying to remember quite a few other gals. Yeah. 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 And uh, I mean, I got a lot out of that workshop. Like I really listened to what you said and you were great. I mean, all of the tips about how to read, how to emphasize things, how to leave space, um, even how to write it on the page. So you know what the hell you're doing, you know, because these are very simple things, but if you haven't done it, they're things that can really help to make it easier. Which, if you don't know, because I mean, yeah, I, of course, my one of my main goals is empower women's voices. So does that mean now because the piece you wrote in that class that yes. then you set to music is fantastic. Do you want to read that? Yeah, I got so much out of it. You know, I wrote this because I wrote what I wrote. You you told us to bring something in that day. So I wrote something the day the night before after our first session and what I brought in. As you were speaking, I said, oh, I don't even like this. Fuck this. And so then I, I wrote this while I was sitting there waiting. Amazing. Cynthia Ross, present us with what you wrote at that fateful day during that workshop. I go to other places. I save towels, shirts and rags that smell like my grandmother, my children, my lovers, my friends. My memories are color, 
smell, emotion, loud, strong, pungent, bright. I go to other places when fear takes over, open my heart and lungs, close my eyes and ears, lose control. I know all that I know about reality. The outline of my body disappears. I go to other places. I seem like I'm here, here in hell. I smell and see that sad, lonely girl sitting in the corner, crying, hiding, waiting for a love that is never coming back. I go to other places. I seek friends that feel like dead lovers, cold and pretty as the night. I scour songs for melody and sadness, words that mean something. Nothing works. I reject happy. Melody bores me. I don't count beats and bars. Music is madness. Math is lines and patterns. Of course I don't count. I've never counted. I was terrible at math and never meant much to anyone. I don't count. I look for lovers that feel like dead friends, hot and ugly like the night. They don't count either. I throw away garbage as soon as I get it. It clings to me. I attract it like I deserve it. The smell, the colors, pungent and potent, heavy, mixed up. Garbage is never orderly. I like order, I don't like math. Trash, garbage, men who rot. Not garbage men, just men who are garbage. Garbage men attract me. I want a man who would throw me out like that, pick me up like that, hold me for a minute, then fucking crush me. They know how to do their job. I don't like lawyers, doctors, bankers, men with money, men without money, men with opinions based on facts they learned in school, men who are good at math, musicians who count. I don't count. I like crazy men, guys with problems, boys with bad attitudes, strong in their imperfection. Pretty repels me. Chip teeth, scars visible and invisible, the ones who won't let me run them. I want those damaged souls to mesh with mine. I don't like men. I don't like myself or math either. I don't count. It's 3 a.m. I can't sleep. Why am I writing about garbage, lovers, sad girls crying on corners, men, math, boys, rags and rotten friends, sadness, old smells, scars, imperfection? I must want sex. Maybe I should clean the house. It's really beautiful, Cynthia. Thank you. Really great. Uh, go, go ahead, Tim. No, I'm saying thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, I have to say you wrote, it's very revelatory and it really deals with obsessions a lot of women have about not counting. I love how you the not counting and then math in the same concept. Really great. And about, you know, men that are rotting because we, are, you know, damaged people are attracted to damaged people. Did you feel, did it take you a while to really understand what it was that you had just revealed to your, about yourself and to yourself? Yes, because uh, it was kind of the beginning of the metamorphosis. I mean, it's almost, it's almost 10 years. It's nine years now for me starting to write this. And then, you know, what happened was I was trying to write a memoir, which I'm not doing right now because this stuff comes easily first thing in the morning because it's the it's the Pros. voice yeah it's the voice it's the inner voice and I've been hiding for so long behind that base where I was safe and where I felt competent and I knew what I had to do and I was hiding behind always the guy or the girl even if I wrote the lyrics it didn't come from my voice so now it's like I'm not doing that anymore. I've, I've like not even played bass for about a year now. I miss it a little, but not a lot. I'll play. You can it. always play it in your house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, out oh, like I'm. This feels like I walked into like a new um, version of my creativity, which was really the old version. 
which was the original version from when I was five years old. Which is the original you. Yes. You know, and to me, it's just so inv- important for women to write, for p- women to read, do spoken word records, whether you perform live or not, you have right. to get your voice out there because it's just mandatory to me, which is why I continue to love doing workshops or supporting women who write and who read. So tell me about what's upcoming in your projects. Well, first of all, let's talk about the fact that we're both on the um, the Faithful LP, which is just right. out, which Tanya Pearson, um, the main madame of the oral history of women in rock, I was her first interview. So that really got her on the path, who's been doing that for quite a while and then decided to take upon herself because I do not fucking understand. I'm so furious because I just read an article yesterday about how Johnny Depp and Rod Stewart raised three hundred thousand dollars for a kitten rescue. I love kittens. I like them to be rescued. But all of these women. Thank you, Tanya, came together because Marianne Faithful is in hospice and none of the cocksuckers or cocks that she sucked will ha- have the decency to step up and give her just the peace of the end of life, which to me is just fricking infuriating. I'm just infuriated. So um, this, hang on a second. Am I muted or am I here? No, you're okay now. Okay, I'm good. So I'm just furious about that. But in the meantime, uh, we, you, I, Shirley Manson, Sylvia Black, Adele Berté, um, uh, so many other women have come together to do this covers album, which just came out to help support. And Tanya wrote a fantastic book about Mary Ann Faithful. And, um, and you do your, your, your song is fantastic and very much true to you, who you are, the vagabond ways I do love life and money, which I'd right. never heard Johnny Winter's version of before. And I have to say, I kind of had to get that kitty litter voice out. Right. Right. So that's one thing that's out right now that people yeah. need to know about and they can order it. It is um, the, um, in the Q records, the vinyl is out. Bunch of gals throwing down Cat Powers with Iggy Pop. I don't know why he's on there. Uh, I haven't liked what he's done since the idiot, but whatever. Not my choice. Anyway, just saying. So we have that. Yeah. That's out now. And, and, then- actually that, and actually that song was the first time that I ever sang lead on anything. Oh. And I did it because Tanya asked and I was going to say no. I said, what am I going to do? I'm a bass player. And she said, surely you can sing. And I was like, because you've done backup. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I said yes. And then I got terrified. And, you know, that was the first thing that I recorded with this guy up there, Tim uh, Bovaconti, who's a multi-instrumentalist. And I found my collaborator. You know, it was like that person, he's a gift to me from the universe. So, yeah. And so, okay, so that's out now. We're all on it, or as many of us as could fit. Um, and then. And you're working on your solo LP of spoken word material, The Secret right. Door, which right. is coming out on, uh, which is coming out this year, I guess. Yeah, April. It's done. It's actually done. I just finished doing the cover. So I'm like, yeah, I gave myself the deadline of the end of January and I got it done before I came down here. And it's 12 pieces. Some are songs, some are poems with just ambient sound. You know, some are like the one that you heard. Well, we're going to hear a few more. And then also you have a poetry book coming out next year, which is fantastic. Looking for Johnny. So what's this um, documentary looking for Johnny? I guess it's Johnny Thunders. Yeah, yeah. It's it's old. It's not new. It's OK, like- but you, you were a, a, a part of that. Right. Because anybody that was in New York knows how important Johnny Thunders was yeah. to everything at that point. And what was this? Um, what was this uh, Stiff Baders? I have never seen that. Has that, yeah, has that been out of way? It's by the same guy. And, you know, like what you were talking about, about Marianne Faithful, how like people are not um, putting their money to support her. Where her mouth once was. Right. Yeah. Right. So Stiv, the Stiv movie, the reason that came about is because I told Danny I didn't really want to be in that Sid Vicious movie, Sad Vacation. I said, what do they need to see me again? Talking about the same stuff. I don't even want to see me again. And he said, no, no, but you were there. You're in that 
show on New York cable with them and nobody else was there. You were in that room. <laughs> right. So I said I would do it, but under the condition that he would do a movie about Stiv, a documentary That's grand. about Stiv. Mm. And then he said, okay. And then he had the hardest time fundraising for that one. No one was giving money to Stiv, you know? Well, documentaries are not the easiest things to do, let's face fact, but they're very important. Right. So, you know, he, he eventually did do it. And like I have a B-Girl song is, is on the soundtrack. It's a really good song, Mystery, one of my favorites that I wrote. And, you know, as I was doing these things and then being in Canada now, mostly because, you know, family. Are you in Canada now? Right, right now I'm in the city. I'm on the Lower East Side, but I'm not able to be here all the time. I have to go back and forth for my mom, basically. So this whole thing, being away from the city was actually good for me. It forced me to find another way to be creative and express myself and to try all these things with this guy, Tim Bovaconti. And, um, you know, Fantastic. yeah. So before I knew it, I had like 12 pieces. So that's done. And that must feel really good because it is kind of an exorcism. It is. And I want to go back to just what we were talking about a minute ago about the piece that you wrote for the workshop, I mean, sometimes I know that when I write something, it might take me weeks, months, sometimes years to go, oh my God, that's what I meant, or to feel the effect of it. And, and I think it's really great that you're doing this, the spoken word stuff in the poetry book, as this new phase of exorcism. You got rid of the ghost clothes. <laughs> you mm -hmm. felt the ghost in the Chelsea Hotel. Yeah. And now we're going forward into the next phase which is so important because we're still fucking here and we ain't going nowhere no we're not strangely we're not going anywhere i want to ask you how do you <laughs> authenticate ghost clothes like i mean i mean people don't the smell the clothes that like were stiffs and gummies you mean is that what you're talking about Dying yeah their clothes like i don't even do that either how do you authenticate them? Right, was the question. Yeah, good you, question. You, I, yeah right. pictures of them wearing them, and also pictures of me wearing like stiff shirt with then him wearing it. You know, the next yeah. day and like stuff like that. Um, the jewelry definitely him wearing it. I mean, yeah, it smells like them. <laughs> and, uh, you, I know what you mean, honey. And, you know, some of them smell good, and some of them yeah. smell like dead ghosts. What can you yeah. say? Yeah. <laughs> But it was a young guy that bought it, a collector who's like a fan. Yep. And I didn't get a lot of money for it, but he loves it. And he's going to keep like all the B-Girl stuff together for me so that when I wrote, when I do write my book, that I can use that stuff. And he's going right. to. You know. And when you're ready to write your memoir, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can come back to me and I'll give you some advice on that. Okay. Well, I got it. Because. Because, you know, I don't know how to write a novel, but I did write a memoir. So that's right. all I know. Why don't we hear a few more poems from your upcoming projects? And Cynthia Ross, I'm so glad we're both still here. My B-girl. Yeah. Walking down 10th Street. Songs drifting from windows and stories told on stoops have disappeared. Births and deaths are nobody's business no longer shared with neighbors or supers or stoop kids. Now only the buildings remember. Nothing is different. Everything has changed. We ate oatmeal for every meal and dried dishes on boards over bathtubs and kitchens. It was 1982 and time moved slow. Billy rolled pennies for cigarettes and milk. Morning walks meant something else entirely. On 10th Street, there was no anxiety because most days we were too dope sick or too high to feel anything. Walking down 10th Street, now only the buildings remember. Beautiful. You, did you, you had a drug problem for a while? Yeah. Didn't most people in New York? Uh... Yeah, yeah, but you know, I'm good. Yeah, 10 years of that, 10 years of my life. And uh, well, I preserved you well, honey. And yeah. you got that. But 10 years, you got, that's the folly of youth. Yeah. Well, I never did drugs in high school. I never did anything. So, I mean, I went from zero to heroin. That was what happened. Was it your husband uh, being diagnosed with HIV? Is, is that what got you to kick? 
No, what happened was um, we moved. I had children, you know, in New York. I, my daughter was born in New York and then we moved to Toronto and we were both clean at that time. And because having a child is a good intervention when you don't care about yourself, you care about. It. So that motivated us to stop. And then I had another my son a couple of years later. And then I had this bright idea one one New Year's Eve after he was born. Let's just get high once on New Year's Eve. And that started a whole. So when I say 10 years, it wasn't 10 years straight, but it was 10 years on and off. And um you know, I wanted to stop. I kept saying, this isn't me. I wouldn't be hanging around with these people if I weren't doing this. I have nothing in common with them, you know. And I wanted to stop. So I went to treatment and my parents looked after the kids so I could do that. And Billy kept using. So I decided I couldn't come back to him for self-preservation. Because that was the relationship. And then... He went to treatment uh, thinking that I would come back if he got clean. Like we stayed friends until he passed away, but he got clean and he found out he was positive in treatment. That's so funny. he stayed, he actually stayed clean until he died in 2001. So this was 19, he went 1990, I went 1989. And um, he did a lot of service work and, spoke in schools and jails and all of that stuff. And, you know, he passed away when our kids were 13 and 15, which is a hard age to lose a parent. So, yeah, a lot of these poems and spoken word stuff, like what you said, Lydia, it's like a clearing. I'm clearing it just because a lot of them are based on grief and sadness. I'm not necessarily in that place right now, but I've written a lot of stuff that expresses that well it's like i'm not negative but i do right. have to i my, my spoken word is aggressively negative about if i'm speaking politics because somebody has to be that voice but you know feelings we have are not all of what we are either right but they have to be expressed right okay i'll read a short one i don't know how much time we have yeah we got a we got, we got a little time bed the bed is empty beside me filled with memories and stories. It pushes me to the edge, my side that was your side when you were here. Now I curl tightly, holding on to nothing but feelings. The empty side is full. The full side is empty. Beautiful, yeah, exactly. Let's have another one while we're at it. Postcards. We shared everything, cut and colored each other's hair, sought sought out cheap rags, men's coats, tight pants, old women's shoes, blurred gender, threw together looks, wore black, rebelled against rules, made music, ran clubs, meshed art film literature. There were no stylists or makeup artists for bands. We emulated and riffed off icons of cool, smoking hot like Brando, Dean and Elvis, wild and tasteful like Audrey, Liz and Bridget, mysterious like Anita, Nico and Marianne, good, bad like the Shangri-Las, soulful like Laura, Ronnie, Dylan and Keith, sad like Leonard and Lou. We were children of the beat generation. We read books, poetry, watched old movies, listened to jazz, blues, pop, and country records. We went on a perpetual journey. Some left, lost on highways and other accidents of time and place. For those of you still traveling, please send postcards. Which we used to do. Right. I miss that. And and also we used to actually read books. Books were really important to our generation not 140 freaking characters on a phone, right. not a small article, not a commentary, not a like dislike bullshit. We read fucking books and that was the self to our souls, which were full of fucking holes riddled with abscesses and absences that made us actually what we are today by realizing uh, we are not alone. 
And as opposed to now, which I think a lot of people, they have this false sense of community until yeah. something bad happens or they're disliked or they feel guilty or right. they're not good enough. And that's not how we viewed who are, I don't even want to say heroes were. Right, exactly. Our influences were. But both we actually were filled by the music and the literature and the films. Right. And books were, I mean, for us, for me anyway, books were the biggest escape. Like I was in another world reading, you know, and I remember re even as a small child reading that, uh, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and that whole, you know, trying to escape yeah. the life that I was living at that time. What were some of the most influential books you read as like a teenager or a young adult, you know, going through, you know, the, the traumas that we do go through? Well, I, well, I read a lot of Russian literature because I loved, you know, Dostoevsky and all the characters. And, you know, I found it again, it took me away somewhere else. Yeah. And uh, a lot of poetry, a lot of Leonard Cohen, a lot of um, older poetry, you know, Blake and um, Baudelaire. Baudelaire and yeah. Dylan Thomas, you know. Um, I read really dark things like Kafka and um, I mean, I guess nothing's changed. I like the same kind of books yeah. as the music. Yeah. Are you going to uh, perform these kind of spoken word? Are you going to go yes, to these? So are you, you going to travel around? Are you going to tour? One of our salons coming soon. <laughs> let me so know when I you're wanna, in New York. Well, I want to do it with you, Lydia. At some I'm point. not a prime. I'm just let me know when you're in New York. We'll yeah. set something up. Well, I when, uh, when, when does the record come out? It'll come out in April. And I'm actually doing my second performance in Toronto at this bookstore called Sellers and Newell, April 18th. Um, with Tim Bovaconti of the material from the album. We did one in September and that was the first time I ever did it. And Ivan Julian was there because he was oh, wonderful. There the and, and what, is, what does Tim play live? What is it? Does he, is it program music? Is it so does he, do? he plays everything on it, on the recording. And then right. we used tracks because yeah. Yeah, it's you a have tiny to. place and he played yeah. guitar and um you feel yeah. more comfortable when there's some music backing your spoken word. Right. But he plays like cello, mandolin, beautiful uh, piano, yeah. um, all of that. And you, got, you can't bring all that around with you. You got to no. have backing tracks. No. And also I can't afford to bring him to Europe. He needs to actually make money. So I'm going to have to yeah. learn how to do it with the tracks and like a guitar player over there. Not that hard, honey. I'll show you how it's done. I'm living proof of how it's done. <laughs> Anyway, fantastic talking to you, Cynthia Ross, my favorite B girl. Thank you, New Olivia. York. Jump. Thank you, Tim. Yes, great yes, always, writing, always spoken word, and poetry coming out. I think it's absolutely most fantastic phase for the next part of your life. Yeah. And whatever part of that I played, I'm very honored to have been. Well, a part you did. Of you played a big part, and I can't wait to like talk to Come you more on. in depth. I can't wait yeah. to see you in the flesh and kiss your beautiful face. Yeah. Well, I'm here till tomorrow morning, but then I'm going back. Hey, yeah, I'm leaving on Thursday, but I'm going to send you my schedule and maybe we could put okay. something up in New York. Thank you so much. This is, Thank and so always much. is, the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dolan. Best big girl ever, Cynthia Ross. Mm -hmm.